Welcome to the DIM 400 lectures on the stifle and the tarsus. I'm Dr. LaRue and I'll be giving these lectures. There are two radiological views necessary to evaluate the stifle, the mediolateral and the cordocranial view. For the mediolateral, the patient is positioned in lateral recumbency with the affected limb closest to the cassette. The unaffected limb is abducted and rotated about 45 degrees away from the area of interest and the stifle is flexed to approximately 90 degrees. A foam pad can be placed under the hock to ensure that a true lateral view of the stifle is performed. This is by lifting the distal aspect of the tibia so that the entire tibia is parallel to the cassette. The primary beam should be centered on the stifle joint. For the cordocranial view, the patient is placed in sternal recumbency and the affected limb is extended cordially alongside the body and slightly rotated laterally. This is so that the patella is placed on the middle of the femur. The unaffected limb should be removed out of the way, out of the area of interest, and the primary beam should be centered on the tibial plateau. The stifles can also be radiographed using a horizontal beam technique. So instead of a vertical beam technique where the, the beam is coming from vertically, as we normally do, the patient is now placed in lateral recumbency with the affected limb uppermost and positioned using positioning devices. And now the beam comes in a horizontal line from caudally and will intercept the image um, receptor, which is placed cranial to the stifle joint. And this view is not commonly employed. So here is a picture demonstrating the stifle anatomy. Take some time to familiarize, familiarize yourself with it and also pay attention to the origin over here and the insertion of the cranial cruciate ligament as this area is often affected by pathology in the dog. This is the same image without the line, so make sure you can identify all the structures on this image and you can use it to test yourself. Additionally, what I can point out on this, these radiographs is the patellar ligament. That is this soft tissue opacity running in a straight line onto the tibial crest. And I can highlight the intertubercular, um, or the, in sorry, the intercondylar eminences of the tibia. This is the medial one, and that is the lateral one over there. In the immature patient, there are ossification centers for the distal femur. So there's the physis, as well as the proximal tibia with its physis, as well as the tibial tuberosity with it with its physis over there. So note on the cordocranial view, the distal femoral physis appears to have multiple lines. And this is because the physis is not flat, but rather undulating. So we are just seeing different levels of the same physis. Also note that the tibial tuberosity also has an um, unusual appearance and it's quite irregular. If in doubt about whether this is normal, you can take radiographs of the opposite limb, providing the opposite limb is normal, or refer to a textbook for more information on whether it's normal or not. Another view that we sometimes take of the to look at the patella is the patella skyline view. The correct term for this is the cranioproximal to craniodistal oblique. This is because the beam remains cranially on the stifle, but it goes from proximal to distal. Hence, cranioproximal to craniodistal. It's good for assessing the depth of the trochlear groove as well as the location of the patella in cases of patella luxation and possibly for patella trauma. And it's especially useful in the equine patient for patella trauma. So here's the patella sitting nicely in the trochlear groove with the true trochlear ridges medially and laterally of the distal femur. Here's another example here. <laughs> 
So here's a little bit of terminology about um, when referring to angular deformities of the limbs. So we'll be looking at the stifle, but I've also included some terminology of the hip as well as the carpus. So genu valgum, or knock kneedness, means that there's lateral deviation of the limb distal to the point of reference. In this case, the point of reference is the stifle. Genu varum, or bow-leggedness, means that there is medial deviation of the limb distal to the point of reference, the point of reference being the stifle. So I always remember it, valgus, the L refers to lateral. So there's lateral deviation of the limb, and varus or varum means medial. So the direction of the deviation is medially distal to the point of reference. The same can be applied to the stifle. So coxa vulga is deformity of the hip joint with an increase in the angle of inclination between the neck and the shaft of the femur, producing a straighter bone. So the angle, if this is the normal one of about 130 degrees, the angle will be greater than 130 degrees and the limb will start looking straighter. Where coxa vara is a decrease in the angle of incidence. So this becomes closer to 90 degrees. So again, if we're talking about the hip as the reference um, point, uh, coxa valga refers to lateral deviation of the limb distal to the area um, of interest or of reference. So it goes laterally and outwards, whereas coxa vara or varum means it goes medially relative to our reference point. Same thing goes for the corpus. So carpal valgus means that L means lateral, so there's lateral deviation of the limb distal to the carpus. So in this case, the manus is directed laterally relative to the carpus. So the first abnormality we're going to be looking at is patella luxation. It can be congenital versus traumatic, with congenital being much more common. In small dogs, there's generally medial luxation, concurrent with genu varum. In large dogs, it's normally lateral luxation, which occurs concurrently with genu valgum. So here's an example of um, what we would see. So in medial patella luxation, there's a medially bowed distal femur. And so there's a sigmoid shaped stifle on the craniocaudal or the cordocranial view. This is indicative of congenital luxation um, because of the malformation of the stifle quadriceps, uh, quadriceps complex. So here is that um, medial sigmoid shape bowing of the stifle. There's also angulation of the femorotibial joint space, so it's not straight. And there's medial displacement of the tibial tuberosity. So the entire quadriceps complex is lying medially to the long axis of the limb. Here's just a zoomed in picture of that um, with some lines demonstrating everything. Here's the distal femur bowing medially with the sigmoid shape of the stifle with angulation of the femorotibial joint space and the tibial tuberosity being located medially instead of centrally here. The patella here is located medially. On a mediolateral view, the patella will appear to be superimposed for the femoral trochlear ridges. And one would need to take the orthogonal cordocranial view to see whether it's sitting medially, as in this case, or if it's luxated laterally. The eventual outcome in medial patellar luxation would be degenerative joint disease. So here's just an example of a stifle with a lot of new bone formation, and we'll cover the specific areas a little bit later, but um, this is a stifle that is affected by arthrosis or DJD. So in summary, for medial patellar luxation, we see medial displacement of the patella, which can be graded clinically. So it's not a radiological grade, but rather something that the clinician will grade. Coxavara will be present, so the femur head neck sh to shaft angle is closer to 90 degrees or at least less than 130 degrees, and this is due to the quadriceps complex malformation. Arthrosis will be the end result, 
And then remember that the cranial proximal to cranial distal or skyline patella view may be useful to locate the patella. So here's an example of a normal patella location within the trochlear groove. And here's an example of it being laterally displaced um, with this me being the medial and the lateral trochlear ridges and the groove being slightly shallow. The stifle um, can also be prone to trauma. For example, on the right hand side here, there is a Salter Harris 1 fracture of the proximal tibia. This is an in skeletally immature patient, so the physis are still open. So the cranial aspect of the proximal tibial physis is widened, and there's also widening of the physis here of the tibial tuberosity. So there's an avulsion fracture here with a fragment sitting over here. So if in doubt about whether the appearance in this area is normal because it can be quite tricky. One can just perform a radiograph of the opposite limb and in this case it's everything is normal here and one can compare especially the widened biases. The stifle is also affected by osteochondrosis so please refer back to the notes on the definition of osteochondrosis but essentially if you remember it's an abnormally thickened cartilage. So on the stifle, one can see a subchondral defect of the distal aspect of usually the lateral femoral condyle. So this is a post-mortem specimen. This is the normal cartilage, this glistening white, and then there is the subchondral defect. A mineralized flap is rarely seen. Joint effusion is common, and the eventual outcome would be degenerative joint disease. It's important not to confuse the extensor fossa for an OCD lesion. So this is the extensor fossa here, and it's seen on the radiograph as this little curve defect over here, and that is the origin of the long digital extensor in the hind limb. So here's an example of what we expect to see on the cordocranial view. There's a saucer-shaped defect of the subchondral bone of the lateral femoral condyle. Additionally, there's stifle effusion, so all of this soft tissue opacity sitting within the joint here, as well as arthrosis present. There's an osteophyte at the distal and the proximal patella, um, as well as on the lateral tibial articulation surface over here. So next we'll look at cranial cruciate ligament rupture. In the acute cases, it's a clinical diagnosis and a cranial drawer sign will be present. On radiographs, in acute cases, there might be joint effusion. For example, on this radiograph, there's this lobulated soft tissue opacity within the joint. This results in obliteration of the infrapatellar fat pad, which I've got some more examples of. And one can, in some cases, see cranial displacement of the tibia relative to the femur. In chronic cases, the most common thing that we see is variable degrees of arthrosis or DJD. So here we are back to the um, schematic image of stifle effusion. So the infrapatellar fat pad should be a triangular fat opacity in this area, but with stifle effusion, it gets cranially displaced and becomes smaller due to effusion within the joint. And there can also be caudal displacement of the fascial planes caudal to the joint. So the end result of cranial cruciate ligament rupture, I've said, is DJD, and the degenerative changes occur at several specific places in the stifle. So osteophytes may occur at the base and the apex of the patella, there and there, the proximal aspect of the trochlear ridges, so there's irregular new bone there, the medial and lateral aspects of the distal femur and proximal tibia, so there's new bone there, there's an osteophyte there, there's an osteophyte there, as well as on the fibella, usually distally, there's some irregular new bone. And then at the origin of the cranial cruciate ligament or at its insertion, there might be an enthesophyte. So example, here's a little um, enthesophyte in the area of the origin. And in the region of the insertion, it would be new bone over in this area. There can also be dystrophic mineralization of the cranial cruciate or avulsion fragments, for example, over here. 
Here's just another example of um, stifle arthrosis, most likely secondary to chronic cruciate ligament pathology. Here is enthesophytic bone here on the tibial plateau at the region of insertion of the cranial cruciate, also bilaterally present. There's osteophytic new bone, as for the previous slide that I've shown you. There's some soft tissue effusion, this lobulated soft tissue within the joint. And this slide also shows this radiolucent concave defect on both sides that is the normal extensor fossa and shouldn't be confused for pathology. Here's an example just demonstrating the infrapatellar fat pad. So it should be a triangular radiolucent or fat opacity within the joint. Spaced cranially over here, we can see that it is radiolucent. And in cases where there is stifle effusion, for example, here, there is obliteration of this fat pad by soft tissue opacity. Also, as you can see in the affected side, there is bulging caudally of the fascial planes by soft tissue opacity, which on this normal stifle joint, one can clearly see the normal fat opacities within the fascial planes caudally. Here's just another example of severe stifle arthrosis. Again, there is an enthesophyte at the origin of the cranial cruciate ligament with a lot of irregular new bone present, um, indicating that there is quite significant stifle arthrosis present. When we look at the tarsus, there are two views, again, that are needed for evaluation, and that's the mediolateral and the plantarodorsal. So for the mediolateral, the patient is positioned in lateral recumbency with the affected limb closest to the cassette. The unaffected limb is moved away out of the primary beam, and the joint is positioned in a natural flexed position with the center of the beam um, centered on the middle of the tarsus. For the plantar dorsal view, the patient is in sternal recumbency. The limb is extended caudally alongside the body, and the limb should be slightly abducted from the body wall to prevent superimposition over the tarsus. And the stifle might need to be rotated medially to ensure a true plantar dorsal position. Centering is on the middle of the tarsal joint. So the tarsus is one of those joints that is quite prone to traumatic luxations. For example, in the top right, there is tibiotarsal luxation with proximal and lateral displacement of the distal fragment, as well as an avulsion fracture um, of the lateral malleolus, sorry, of the medial malleolus, lateral malleolus, sorry. There's also a lot of gas within the soft tissue swelling, indicating that this is an open fracture luxation. The tarsus is also affected by OCD. This occurs mostly at the medial trochlear ridge of the talus. On this plantar dorsal view, that is the medial trochlear ridge there, which is normal in this case, or less commonly the lateral ridge, which is this ridge over here, can be affected. Sometimes both can be affected. The end result of OCD is invariably DJD, and joint effusion might also be seen. Rottweilers seem to be predisposed to this condition. So here's an example of a normal plantar dorsal view. That's the normal medial and the normal lateral trochlear ridges. In the affected tarsus over here, there's flattening of the medial ridge, and the joint space appears widened. In this example, there are some mineralized fragments associated with the medial ridge, um, and one can make a diagnosis of tarsal OCD. And that brings us to the end of the lectures of radiology of the distal limb, stifle and the tarsus.